quick, important announcement. Um, tomorrow is Pastor Colby's 50th birthday. And I want, especially those that know him really well, and he means a lot to you. He's affected your life in some way, shape, or form. Please get Kieran a short video just wishing him a happy birthday. Sunday night, though, we are celebrating, so we're having dessert for him, and um, they're going to be awesome. So they're kind of a special dessert. It's not like I'm buying a bunch of sheet cakes, so I do need to know if you're coming um, so that we can have enough of those made. So if you're planning on coming Sunday night, um, please let one of us leaders know or let Karen know when you send him your video. But don't forget to do that little video just to thank you um, for what he's done for you in your life. Um, just figuring out which way I want to start this. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you for these amazing youth who have come to sit and, and hear your word, to hear your truth, to grow and to learn more about who you are and who they are in you, Father. I just thank you that your Holy Spirit is here and that he is moving among us. He's ready to minister to every heart, that he will make sure that each one, Lord, hears what they need to hear. Father, I pray that you would speak through me, that you would place your words in my mouth. Father, that you'd bring stories and um, examples to my remembrance to help those to see things the way that they need to see them, Father. We just thank you for your wisdom and your truth and your life that pours out each Wednesday night. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Open your Bibles. We're going to look at the book of Genesis for a minute. And um, how many of you guys are doing the Read the Bible in the Year program? You've been working on it. That's awesome. So you're going through Genesis. So we're going to do some stuff here tonight. Um, but it is going to be so good. Um, I'm going to pick on my son this morning had a revelation that I don't even know that I've heard. And it was wild. So hopefully he doesn't try to crawl under the seat. Asher was reading the book of Genesis. And I just want to, wait, first of all, does anybody not have a Bible? If you don't have a Bible in this room and you'd like one to look at these things with, raise your hand. Gabe, can I get your help? And Oliver, maybe jump up. If you don't have a Bible, put your hand up if you need one. No? No? We're good? Okay. It's so important to have your Bible. This is the sword of the Spirit. One time I was getting on an airplane, and I had my carry-on, and my Bible was in it. Um, did you know your Bible weighs about two pounds? Just saying. I needed to drop two pounds in my suitcase, so I moved my Bible into my carry-on. Um, and there was this gentleman. He was going through, what's that called where you're, what's it called? Where your suitcase goes through the machine. Yeah, TSA or security check or whatever. And then they, like, look through the screen at what's in your. There must have been something in my bag that they needed to investigate further. So they had it all unzipped. And there was this uh, guy in the, the TSA, whatever you call it. He opens up my. And I'm in, like, a really huge airport. I'm not in uh, Sioux Falls. I'm in San Francisco. And so. He's got my bag going through there, and he pulls out my Bible, and he lifts it up over this huge crowd of people because my bag went ahead of me, and I'm still down in the line. And he's like, who's got the sword of the Spirit with him? <laughs> it's awesome. I was like, uh, that's me. And then he just, like, commending me over the entire crowd. That was really exciting. Uh, but one time I went through there, and there was a teenage, well, teenage-looking boy. I don't know if he was a teenager or not, but he was young. And I had a backpack purse that was a, uh, a pump for women when they're breastfeeding, okay? So I had this. It looked just like a purse. And so this kid, um, but it's a breast pump for when you're, you have nursing babies and you need to get milk for them, right? Y'all okay? And so I'm going through the checkout, and the kid goes, the kid grabs my purse thing, and he sees the stuff on the screen. And he's like, what is this? right? And so he opens it up, and he's pulling out the tubes. And he goes, ma'am, are you on a breathing machine? And I'm over another crowd, right? And I was like, 
no, um, that's actually a breast pump. And he starts shoving down those tubes as fast as he possibly can. And all the women in the line begin to lose it. And one lady goes, serves him right. <laughs> it was the best. You, you guys are right. You good? You, you, you do laugh, right? That was hilarious. Anyway, the girls are giggling. Um, it was really funny. So I have fun times at airports, but the Bible is so very important. The sword of the spirit. This is your weapon. This is your daily bread. Find one that you love. Find one that you can consume your time with. Um, make sure you get to own it. Uh, get familiar with it. It's literally so very important. Um, I love the Amplified Classic. That's my absolute favorite. I read that one a lot to you guys. Um, mine is a parallel. So I got King James on one side, Amplified Classic on the other, so I can read, bounce back and forth. There are study Bibles. They're going to help you understand what you're learning. There's only a few that I recommend of that kind because not all study Bibles are created equal. So the study Bibles I recommend, you want to write that, this down, is the Fire Bible or the Spirit-Filled Living. Those two study Bibles are awesome. They're going to help you, like, when you get to a stuck spot and you're like, why did they do that? Then you jump down and you look at the lower half on a study Bible, and it'll usually, not always, it'll break it down for you. It'll help you understand what was happening at the time, why, you know what I mean? And then it'll also give you places in Scripture where that same concept or teaching or scenario is in other places in your Bible. So you can go read where God said a certain thing in like three different places and where that applied, right? Um, you can also mark your pages. If you have a hard time finding your location, um, Ireland's got one. You hold your Bible up, sweetheart. You got those tabs on there. These are outstanding. You can buy Bible tabs so that you can find the books. So Bible tabs, guys, if you're not an accurate Bible tabber, find a girl. Have her help you. This Bible right here has got its own tabs built into the pages. Can you show them the side of your Bible? Just kind of hold it up and turn it sideways. Is that a spirit-filled? It's a study Bible, though. It looks like a spirit-filled living. Spirit-filled living Bible. That one's awesome. Those are bigger, but... Um, you can have travel size. So like mine, I don't have a study Bible that I carry around with me, but I do carry around my parallel. And um, I love multiple translations. My other favorite one is the Passion. We'll be reading out of that tonight um, quite a bit. But get a Bible that you understand because if you don't understand it, you're not going to read it. But Asher was reading this morning, and he was in Genesis chapter 15. And he had this epiphany, and he asked me a question. I was getting ready for something, and I didn't understand at first what he was meaning. And let me tell you something. If you read the Bible just to barrel through it, you won't absorb cool things like this. But I, li I don't know. This, this is, could just very well be a fresh revelation. I've never heard anyone teach on this. But he was sitting there, and he's reading, and he goes, Mom, so in chapter 15 of Genesis... There's this moment, okay, and Abram, he's not Abraham yet, Abram just goes and saves Lot's behind, okay? Lot just got totally taken by uh, kings that had been defeating other kings in the Gentile nations. So like four kingdoms went up against five kingdoms, right? And there was this whole battle and these are Gentiles. These are people that don't worship the one true God. They're not Israelites. Uh, one of the kings is the king of Babylon at the time. And then there's other kingdoms all going up against each other. There's this war and Lot gets caught in the middle. Okay, He's like in the crossfire because he's living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, And the two kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, those are two separate kingdoms. They're fighting together with these other kings. And Asher's like getting lost in the names. I was too. I mean, their names are messed up, okay? You're literally reading this and you're like butchering it all. And so um, there, I was just going to read one to you. But 
Anyway, so there's this, so a Abraham rescues Lot. So we'll just say, <laughs> like Amraphel, that's one of the kings, right? And so Abram takes 300 is trained Israelites uh, from his own household, okay? Now, you got to think about this. These are four kingdoms and five kingdoms, and all Abram does is take 300-ish, because he hears that his nephew was taken captive by one of these wicked kings. Because Sodom and Gomorrah, those kings lost and they went running, right? And so as they're running, uh, Lot gets taken, all of his belongings get taken, his family gets taken, and uh, somebody escapes and they run back to Abram and they tell him, hey, your nephew has been taken captive, so Abram takes over a little over 300 of his own household, and he goes after those kingdoms. And he literally, you can watch his whole war strategy go down. And you're like, how does this guy know how to do that? He's not a warrior, right? But yet he sends these guys in. They, they split off, and they ambush them. And he takes them all out, and he takes all their spoil, and he gets all the people back, even for the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah. It's crazy, right? All Abram wants is Lot and his belongings. So Abraham rescues his nephew. He's not even a part of this, this, uh, this scene. And I told Asher as he's reading this, I said, pay attention because I know you can't say these names. And it gets really confusing, but there's a line here that you got to, it's kind of like the B-roll. Do you know what B-roll is in movies? Is anybody a movie buff in this room? You know how you're watching a movie and there's like the main characters, the main story, Right? Can you think of a movie, any movie? And then there's like these sub-characters and these sub-stories, and they're all like working together, and eventually they're going to collide, right, into the movie, right? Do you guys know what I mean? Like there's a romantic story over here happening, and the, the movie switches, and then you got the main characters, right? Main characters of the Old Testament in the Bible are the Israelites, okay? God's people. As you're reading your Bible, you got to pay attention to the main story, because it runs throughout the whole Bible, okay? So as you're reading the Old Testament, and you read about Cain and Abel, and then Cain kills his brother, right? And then it goes down a lineage, and eventually you find Noah. Here's a righteous man. So God brings Noah out of this wicked, wicked situation. He floods the whole earth, and then you have Noah. And then it goes down a lineage, and finally mankind gets even, even more wicked, these nations that rose up, these ones that are at war in this story, they are also pagan worshiping gods. So they worship demonic gods. They don't worship the true God. And you think, well, that's not half bad, right? Well, no, these are demon gods. These are, every, these are the reason why God said not to have sexual worship in the temple. Why? Because that's what they do. These are the reason God said you better not sacrifice your child to Moloch. He's talking in Leviticus. Why? Because that's what they do, right? They murder their own children to the fire god, okay? So they are not good people. But there's this king of Babylon that fights and wins out over Sodom and Gomorrah, and you pay attention to that kingdom. Why? Because it rises up to be one of the greatest. This is the B-roll, okay? But eventually, Babylon comes and takes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And then Daniel is risen up. So that's like the sub-stories. Eventually, they're all going to collide. Okay? So as you read your Bible, just think of it like that. The Gentile nations, or the nations that the Bible calls pagan, these are going to come into play later. Does that make sense? So these, you don't have to memorize all the characters. You don't have to get worried about all those crazy names unless you're going to go do a character study. Just kind of get the gist of what's happening. Just try to keep sorting it, right? So you know he's going after Lot. All these weird king names. He's saving Lot from these kingdoms. Oh, but king of Babylon, Babylon I recognize. Why? Because Babylon's going to come into play later, okay? So he's reading this, and God takes Abram, and he, he approaches him in a vision in Genesis chapter 15. Now, what's a vision? Anybody know? What would you think it is? Vision. Just think about the word. What's a vision? A 
vision? Anyone want to give me a guess? What's a vision? To see something, okay? Right? Something that, whether it's a dream or maybe they're taken up in the spirit, they have a vision. They see something. So afterwards, in verse 15, so after Abram rescued Lot, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision. In a vision. So Abram saw something. Right? And it says, so the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Abram, don't yield to fear. For I am your faithful shield and your abundant reward. I'm just going to tell you something that can happen while you're reading the Bible. Cool things that happen when reading the Bible. So Asher goes, Mom, who's the word of the Lord? And I went, who's the word of the Lord? I was like, the word of the And so I thought he was asking me, who's saying this? And I said, well, it says the Lord. It doesn't say the Lord God. Because usually the Lord God means Jesus. Why does it mean Jesus? Because the Lord, the Lord, God, those three words together actually mean Yerhe Vadhe in the Hebrew. What does that mean? It means look at the hands, look at the nails. Look at the hands, look at the nails. Well, who is that? Jesus. The Lord doesn't mean that in the Hebrew, if it says the Lord. So I was like, well, the word of the Lord and he goes, no, wait a second, Mom, and I hope you can grasp this. Just, just sit here for a minute with me because I didn't get it right away when he was asking me. He goes, he's having a conversation with, with the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord came to him and said. So the word of the Lord is speaking, and he's seeing it, right? I had always thought, well, the word of the Lord, all of a sudden, Abram must have heard God. That's what I thought. But it says the word of the Lord came to him. And said this. And then Abram had a conversation with him. He said, he says, you're going to be the father of many nations. You're going to have many children, right? And then through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Nathan, Abram's like, how can this be? I've got this one servant. I have no children. I'm, he's, he's not able to have kids. So he's having a conversation with the word of the Lord. Now, if he was just sitting there and he heard Abram. Right? And then the word of the Lord says this to him. Hey, Abram, I am your exceeding great reward. He's saying, I am. Well, that's really interesting if he was only hearing words of the Lord. And he's having this conversation, and I'm literally standing there awestruck in front of my son going, wow. I think, Asher, you just had a revelation. Who do you think is talking? Well, he said in John... This is what Asher said, because he's learned this at youth. He's learned it from his father. He knows this. He said in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. You following? And, and then it goes on to say, And the Word became flesh, a physical person, and lived or dwelt among us. Who is that? Jesus. So who? Is it possible, I'm not saying this is gospel truth, but it literally hit me like between the eyes as Asher was asking the question, he's having a conversation with the word of the Lord. Is it possible that this is Jesus and Jesus came to Abram in a vision? How cool is that? Right? Because we know Jesus steps on the scene for certain things. You're going to see it in a minute. But how awesome is it that that revelation came to a 17-year-old boy just reading his Bible in the year program, right? He finished up the book of Matthew. He's doing things a little different, but he was at Genesis 15, and he's like, hey, the word of the Lord came to him, and he's having a conversation with the word of the Lord. So is he having a conversation with God's words, or he's having a conversation with a person? I thought that was pretty outstanding. So, that's just one nugget as you read, go through the Old Testament. We're not talking about Abraham right now, though. We're going to talk about Jacob. Because I really feel like this is the word of the Lord for you tonight. <laughs> um, and it was confirmed in a few different places. But first, I want you to go to Revelations. Can 
Can you look up in Revelations, Kevin, for me? It says, they that overcome will receive a new name. To him that overcomes. Two seventeen. So Revelations two verse seventeen. It says he who is able to hear, let him listen and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies or the churches. To him who overcomes or conquers, I will give to eat of the manna that is hidden, and I will give him a white stone with a new name engraved on the stone, which no one knows or understands except he who accepts it. Could you put that up in the amplif or the passion? See how that's worded there. But the one whose heart is open, let me ask you a question tonight. Is your heart open? The one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is presently saying to all the churches. To everyone who's victorious, I will let him feast on hidden manna and give him a shining white stone. And written upon the white stone is inscribed his new name known only to the one who receives it. So you guys know that song that I love by uh, Charity Gale, and it says, there is a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. If you overcome, the Lord is going to give you a new name. What do you think your new name will be? Have you ever thought about that? Or did you even know that happens? It's going to happen. There's a new name for you. So God does this all over the Bible, actually. You can see it through many stories here. But this is about the end times. So this says, to everyone that's victorious, I will give him the feast on the hidden manna. Now, cool thing is, you guys are reading the Old Testament now. You're reading your Bible. You all know what manna is. What is manna? What's manna? Some of you are like, I'm not at that story yet. What's manna, Asher? Manna. It's not money. Anybody know what manna is, Trevin? Manna? Bread from heaven. Where did it happen? Exodus, right, when the children of Israel are leaving Egypt and they're in the wilderness and there's no food and it rains, manna, right, manna from heaven, and it's actually heavenly bread. So God is not really probably talking about a sustenance that you can eat here, but he's talking about a hidden manna. You're going to feast on something that God has, right? And he's going to give you a shining white stone. And written upon that white stone is inscribed a new name that only you will know who receive it, right? So if you go back to the book of Genesis, you're going to see, you saw it with Abram. Does anybody know what God changed Abram's name to? Abraham, right? Could you imagine being Abram with no kids? Because Abram itself means father. So Abram has no children, in, and he's been living in this city of Ur, right? And all of these uh, religions, you know, 
Cultures change, people change, people get older, but you want to know what doesn't? Human nature. Human nature doesn't change. Let me ask you a question. If your name was Father, let me ask some of the teen guys. If your name was Father, that's the meaning of your name, Landon, and you had no kids and you were an older man, how would the people in your city act? What would they say about you? How would other guys act? Yeah. Confused? But what would they do probably? Ah, human nature doesn't change, does it? If your name means father and you have no kids, and it's a big deal in your culture to have children. Israelites and, and, and even in these pagan nations, having kids was a big deal. Because you have no one to carry on your name. And your name means father, they'd probably give you a nickname, Right? In the community, you're known among them, right? Because your wife doesn't ha can't have kids and neither can you. You're impotent. You can't have kids, right? Culture does change, but people don't, do they? So if you think about Abram, who's supposed to be a father, hanging out in a big city, he's probably known as the fatherless father, right? And then God takes a hold of Abram. He gives him this promise. He says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And God, he tells God, how is this going to happen? Because I have no child. You've left me childless, God. Right? And then God tells him, you're no longer going to be Abram. Your name is going to be Abraham, which actually means father of many nations. Wow. Could you imagine Abram in this moment? Because it just got a little bit more unbelievable. My name means father, and now you're going to make me walk around this zone and go by Abraham? How's that going to flow, God? I mean, I would wonder. And Abraham doesn't have this conversation with God necessarily in the Bible, but I could not imagine going from father and having no kids, right? And now your name's going to be father of many nations. They're really going to hammer me, God. I can't, and, and do I have to walk around calling myself Abraham? Now, we know, because you guys are trained up in the things of God, your words have power. Say, my words have power. My words are either death, say it, or life. You know this, why? Because the Bible says in James, your tongue's like a rudder on a ship. What you say will steer your life. What you say about yourself will steer your life. Now, could you imagine being in your high school and, and having kids was a big deal, and now you're walking around calling yourself Abraham, and you, you, your name meant father, and now you have to call yourself a father of many nations? It'd be like, there goes the crazy person who thinks he's going to be a father of many nations. He's walking around calling himself that, right? So God does something cool for Abraham, though. He says, Abraham... You need to come out and go to the place that I'm going to send you. Why? Now, here's your moment, young one. As you're reading this Old Testament story and you're trying to figure out how do I relate, then you place yourself. You say, which one's me and which one is so-and-so, and you'll be a different character every time you read that story, I promise you, because you're going to be in a different state. But in this moment, you totally get it. Why? Because you're in high school and there's labels, right? Right? Do they not have labels in your school? Anybody? You got labels, right? You've got, you don't just have the jocks and, well, in our school we had the cowboys because they, they did rodeo and did all those things. But you also have what? Lame, name some labels. Throw them out. What? Furries? What else? What else? You got labels. Name some labels. That's a label. We had preppies. They, they were the really, you know, they, they dressed really well. They had all the finest things. I don't know what you would call them. What do you call them? The, the Lululemon people. Do you know what I mean? You have, what, what do you call them? In your school, what's the label? Why does anybody want to share these with me? I know you have them. Are they cuss words? <laughs> Do you have jocks still? Do you still call them jocks? No, what do you call them? People that are way into sports. By their sport now? They're just called basketball players? 
But you have labels, right? So Abram had a label. Let me ask you a question. Would it have shipwrecked Abram's faith to believe God that he would be Abraham if he would have stayed among his peers? If God changes your name and he tells you this is your new identity and everybody's calling you by your old name, your old label, and saying this is who you are, how hard would it be for you to change? How hard would it be for you to believe the promises of God and then actually see them happen? Because the words of your mouth can't abort the promise of God, right? And if you start to believe what everybody else is saying, even though God himself said, I'm giving you a new name. But Abram, he called out because he knew Abram couldn't stay there. He says, you have to be Abraham now, and I'm going to call you out, and I'm going to bring you out of those people. And as you're reading Abraham, there's someone in this room that says, I need to leave my friend group because I'm never going to change. Right? But this isn't the story I'm focusing on today. I'm just showing you where a name changed. Sarah, his wife, her name was Sarai. And her name, Sarai, S-A-R-A-I. Sarai meant quarrelsome. Could you imagine somebody giving you that name? Do you guys know what quarrelsome means? Like you literally are argumentative. Like you... That would really feel good, right? Your parent gives birth to you, and they're like, your name's Quarrelsome. From the day you were born, thanks, Mom. Label me Quarrelsome. You don't even know me yet. You know what I mean? So who names their kid that? But Sarai's name was named that. So God, actually, when he renames Abram to Abraham, he also gives Sarah a new name. Sarah gets this name, Sarai. Sarai gets Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. And Sarah means princess. So he says, Abram, I'm going to give you Abraham. You're going to be the father of many nations. And Sarai, I'm going to give you Sarah. And what's crazy is he's giving them these names before there's any sign of the possibility of any change, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure if Abram did not look like the father of many nations because he had no kids, right? Sarah definitely didn't look like no princess, Right? But we know she eventually did look somewhat like a princess because Abraham took her. The Old Testament is so fun. If you guys would sit and read it, he literally would go through kingdoms and lie that she was his wife. He'd tell the kings because she was so beautiful. And she's literally old. He's like, she's so beautiful. They're going to think she's my, they're going to want her and they're going to kill me to have my wife. Why would Abraham think that, first of all? Because that's how those cultures acted. That was a thing. They want your wife, they're going to kill you, right? So he would lie because he was worried, and he'd say, say you're my sister, right? And then a, a king actually took her as one of his wives in one of the scenarios. Go read it. It's nuts, right? But I'm thinking she must have looked like a princess. I don't know if that transformation happened, but when God gives you a new name, there's a new identity with it. But there's this moment in the Bible, it talks about a guy named Jacob. And if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 25. So you have Abraham, and he finally gets a son whose name is Isaac. And he is born to Abraham in his old age. And Sarah does bear him. And she's old too, which is a flat miracle, okay? And they have Isaac. Isaac's the chosen son, and Isaac marries a woman named Rebekah. We're not even going to talk about the first woman he married because he got tricked. These Old Testament stories are so fun. you got to read them for yourself. They are better than, like, Jerry Springer. You guys know who he is? Talk shows where they're like, this is your baby's daddy kind of shows. Do you know what I mean? It happens all over the Old Testament, right? You're like, wait a second. Lot married his cousin's uncle, you know, and you're just, you're like, I don't get it. But there's this moment where Rachel, the chosen wife, the one that Isaac wanted, right? Wait, no, sorry, I'm, I've got the stories mixed up. Jacob worked for, whoo, hold on. Isaac's wife is Rebecca, and Jacob's wife is Rachel. Help me. 
Anyway, Isaac doesn't work for her. Jacob works for his wife, but that's, in the, that's later in the game. So I got ahead of myself. Sorry, just scratch that. Erase. So you have Jacob. He's born to Isaac. Isaac's wife is pregnant with twins. So we're going to start there. So Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has these twins. You ready? With his wife, Rebecca. So this is how the story of Isaac begins. He was the beloved son of Abraham and the successor of Abraham's blessing. When he was 40, who was 40? Isaac, right? He married Rebecca. She was the daughter of Bethuel, the sister of Laban. Both her father and brother were Armenians from Padam Aram. Now, that's where you guys are like, I can't read these words. Just ignore it. Just pay attention to the story, okay? Now, because I have to teach you how to read the Bible, too. Don't check out on those big names. Capture the story, okay? What is the main point? So now Rebecca was unable to have children, but Isaac pleaded with Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And she did get pregnant, for Yahweh responded to Isaac's prayer. During her pregnancy, Rebekah could feel twins thrashing and struggling with each other inside her womb. So these twins are fighting. Now, you all have never had children, but my brain went, oh, my goodness. Rebecca's having a C-section because their cords are all wrapped around their necks. That's what I was thinking. Because in this today's day and age, if, you're if your child in your womb does too many flips, they get their umbilical cord wrapped around their neck. And then if they give birth to them, they could die. So they have to cut women open sometimes. So the Lord worked a miracle there with those two wrestling in her womb. So you could picture two babies wrestling. Y'all picturing it in your head now? Two, two tiny babies wrestling. This story's getting good. Okay? And Yahweh answered her saying, the two sons in your room, womb will become two nations. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Rebecca. You're going to give birth to two nations. <laughs> right? And the two peoples within you will become rivals. Oh, great. That's exciting right before your children are born. My children are going to fight constantly. Right? One people will become stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. This is nuts because in Jewish custom, in Israelites uh, especially, in, the, in those customs, the older is the firstborn. The older is the chosen one. The older one is the head of the home. He gets double portion. So he gets double double what everybody else gets. He is like numero uno in mom and dad's eyes, okay? Why is that? Because the, the, the firstborn receives the inheritance. It's like on my husband's farm, okay? Back in the day, the firstborn son on a farm inherits the farm, okay? That used to be how things were done. They get the land and everything. Why? Because it's an inheritance. You don't break up the farm. You don't sell off the farm. So the firstborn raises up and he serves in his father's house and he serves hard, day, long days. He learns all of the, the way farms operate. And then he comes along and when the father begins to get old and pass away, he passes the farm down to the firstborn. Okay, so it's a big deal to be a firstborn son here in this scenario. So the older serving the younger is, is an impossibility unless God does something. Okay, because Isaac will give the blessing to the oldest. That's the way it has to be, right? And that's how God ordered it. And God tells not Isaac, he tells Rebecca, right? Tells the mom, okay? So... When the time came for Rebecca to give birth, sure enough, she had twins. And the first one came out reddish and covered with hair, like a hairy garment. Poor guy. So they named him Esau, which literally means hairy. Y'all, I thought quarrelsome was bad. You're going to name your kid Harry. And it's not because Harry, now Harry is a name, but they named him Harry because he was Harry. And he was so hairy, we'll get to that part. He was so hairy. Ask how hairy was he? Ask me. 
He was so hairy that when the mom goes to fool the uh, uh, later on in life, the father for the blessing, he, she puts the goat's skin on her son for him to feel to see if it's Esau. That's how hairy this guy was, okay? Like gave birth to Wolverine. So they named him Esau, which means hairy, and his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. Have you ever seen a newborn baby be able to do that? I've never. I've never. Now, my, my newborn babies, they would make fists, but they couldn't really control them. I had to keep little mittens on them because they'd like poke their eyes and stuff like that. They couldn't literally grab the heel of their brother and say, no, I want out first. He's fighting for firstborn in the womb, y'all. So he comes out grabbing the heel of his brother, okay? And the mom, he's grabbing so hard the mom sees it. You, could you imagine two babies coming out at the same time and one flies out holding the other one's ankle? Like, this is an insane scene. Bible's already awesome, right? And then it gets even more awesome. So she says, and his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. So Jacob, well, if Esau means Harry, what do you think Jacob means? Because it's the first thing she's looking at. What do you think Jacob means? Just take a wild guess. If Isa comes out and she looks at him and he's hairy, Jacob comes out, what do you think she named him? What do you think Jacob means? Hairless? No. He's grabbing his brother's heel. What do you think Jacob means? Heel grabber. That's what it means. Heel grabber. You got it? That's awesome. So Jacob means heel grabber, but here's what it also means. It means deceiver. It means cheater, right? It ain't a good name. Like, she legit names that one Harry and this one cheater or deceiver. Is that exciting? Would you like to be called that your whole life? Talk about a label, right? Sometimes our parents give us names like, you're always blank. You never blank, right? They don't mean to. They don't understand the power of their words I have to check myself even because, but that, that like took, I mean, I, 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 when I'm hard on myself and going, listen, I'm always speaking, I, you need to talk to the king in your son. That's what sometimes the Lord corrects me and he says, you know, if your son never does this or that, never picks up whatever, or your daughter, I should use my girls because um, Listen, I have awesome kids, all of them, but sometimes when you, all you see is what you see, you, you can start to speak to that. And God says, no, talk to the king in that one. Talk to the, the daughter, the, the daughter of the king in that one, right? Call them by who they are, not by what they're doing. Call them by who they are, not by what they're doing. God doesn't call you by your sin. He calls you by your name. He doesn't call you by your mistake. He calls you by your name. And you might go to him and all you can see is what you've done wrong, but that's not what he sees, right? So in this moment, this mom labels her children, and I'm like, well, at least I'm not as bad as Rebecca. She gave him the permanent name Deceiver, right? Then the boys grew up, and Esau became a rugged outdoorsman and a hardy hunter, but Jacob was more contemplative, content to stay close to home. Now, contemplative actually means um, tranquil, quiet, meditative. Tranquil, quiet, meditative. He was just quiet. He's more thoughtful, okay? His brother Esau was a hunter, and he became his father's favorite, because he hunted great game and his dad loved to eat it. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of eating wild game, but Rebecca dearly loved Jacob. <laughs> I'd like the quiet one too. <laughs> just saying. Sometimes you just need a break. So one day when Jacob was cooking the stew, Esau returned from hunting. So Jacob was cooking, Esau was hunting. And he was famished, smelling the aroma of food. Esau saw Jacob. I'm starving. Let me eat some of that red stuff you're cooking. This is why he also called, it was called Edom. 
That's another lesson. Yes, Jacob said to him, but first you must trade me your birthright. Say, what? Jacob is literally, I will give you some of the stew that I am cooking. It was bean stew, by the way. It was lentil, beans. And he says, so like Jacob's, there's not even any meat in it. And he's like, give me some of what you're cooking. And Jacob says, okay, but first give me your birthright. Now, how many of y'all would be like, done. I'm going to give you my birthright. Anybody? Anybody? Now that you understand what a birthright is, your firstborn birthright. Anybody would do that? Even if you were really legit starving? Now, it's not possible that he was really starving that bad. But this moment, he was so desperate. He was so desperate. He says, can't you see I'm dying of hunger? What good is the birthright if I'm dead? Now, pause here for a second. Because this seems unrelatable for you. But let's talk about your birthright as a daughter or a son of the king, okay? What's your birthright in the kingdom of God? What's your birthright? What did Jesus die to give you? We learned that all the blessings that God promised Abraham would come upon you. We learned that, right? Your birthright is an inheritance, okay? Because the firstborn son laid down his life and he died for you to take your place, right? So he gave you his inheritance, his birthright, okay? What is the inheritance that he gave to you? He didn't just give you everlasting life. He says that I came to give you life and life more abundant, right? So he gave, he came to bless your life financially. He came to give you his spirit. He came to give you everything that he has, okay? But in the moment, you're like, man, what good is my birthright, Jesus, if I lose all my friends and I'm alone? What good is my birthright? Can't you see that I'm dying, right? I mean, we think Esau's nuts here, but This isn't really about Esau because we learned, I told you back in Corinthians, I showed you in the scripture that the Bible says that all these people here are for our example to learn from. What can we learn from Esau? And some of us go, I would never trade my birthright for a bowl of soup, but would you trade it for one night at the movies watching something that literally implants fear and terror and Jesus died to set you free from that? Or, or maybe, or maybe um, there's an addiction in some area of your life and you're like, what good is this birthright if I, you know, I mean, just kind of just try to relate to Esau a minute because if you read your Bible, it's going to be super boring. Well, actually, it's not going to be super boring. We already got excited about somebody grabbing someone's heel and somebody's hairy, right? It's an actually pretty interesting story already. But if you actually can put yourself into the story, It'll take on a whole nother level, right? So what is Esau really saying here? I mean, I just literally thought, what, how could I be Esau in this moment? What have I done to be Esau sometimes? So Jacob insisted, first swear to me that you'll give it to me. So Esau swore an oath and surrendered his birthright to Jacob. That's nuts. Then Jacob gave Esau some lentil stool, stew and bread. And when Esau had finished eating and drinking, he just got up and walked away. Esau cared nothing about his own birthright. He didn't value it. Jacob knew what it meant. You think that Jacob actually by this point has had a talk with his own mom? And his mom said, when you were in my womb, Jacob, this is what the Lord told me. Just curious. So was Jacob, because one of the other names for Jacob means schemer supplanter do you think that Jacob was sitting there trying to figure out how to make what God had promised him happen I think he was I think he sat there and thought how do I make what because how on earth am I going to get this birthright God promised it to me but how am I going to get it so he saw his opportunity and he took it right and then it goes on 
And then you see this moment, and I'm not going to go into that part of the story because I want to get to another part of this story, where you see Isaac is dying and he can't see anything. He's got to be blind as a bat because I don't know how this all went down so well. But Isaac says, I'm going to give you the father's blessing. And it's different from the birthright. I'm going to lay my hand on you and give me, you my blessing. Would you, Esau, please go out and kill me some game and fix up the meal that I love? So Esau decides he's going to go do that, right? And Rebecca heard it. And she goes to her son Jacob and she says to Jacob, 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 your father's going to give the blessing. You have to get it. So you go and you, I'm going to kill two goats. I'm going to cook up the food like he likes it. And, and, and she said, you go get on your brother's clothes. And Jacob's like, this isn't going to work. How's this going to work, mom? Right? And he's looking at his mom. And he's saying, this can't work. I'm, and he literally says, I'm bald. Who said that his name was going to be bald? I don't remember. I have no, I have no, did you say that? He's like, I have no hair. <laughs> My father's going to know it's not me. And she said, I have a plan. And she put the goat hair on his arms and his neck. Now, I don't know how you can even attach that for somebody to make it feel like it's really your flesh holding all that hair. I don't know how that works. But she did it. And he goes to his father, and, and Isaac's like, you sound like Jacob. He says, come close. So he fills his arms. He says, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Isaac, uh, or Esau. So then he hugs him, and he smells him, and he can smell the wild air of, of the fields on his son. He says, well, you're, uh, you're Esau. So he literally speaks the blessing. And it's so serious that literally when it all goes down and Jacob and Esau, Esau finds out that Jacob stole the blessing by fooling and tricking his father, Esau goes nuts and he begins to wail and cry. And he tells his father, is there no blessing left for me? And his father's like, I am so sorry. That's how serious it is in God's kingdom. And what's crazy is it's literally a real thing. And you watch it happen in Jacob's life. Jacob runs from his brother. And the second Jacob begins to run, his blessing of his father is still chasing him. He literally begins to multiply his lands. He marries. He has children. His flocks, his herds begin to increase exponentially. Why? Because he has the blessing and he has the birthright. It's a real thing in the kingdom of God. The blessing of the Lord on you. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich. It's a, just a done deal. It just happens, right? If you have the blessing of the Lord on your life, it's kind of like everything you touch turns to gold. Do you remember reading that story as a kid, the Midas touch? Actually, it wasn't a very good story because he, like, killed people on accident. You know what I mean? Because the person would turn to gold. But it's literally like you have the Midas touch. The Bible says that when you're, when you're walking in the path of God, everything that you put your hand to prospers. That means, that means if you're working for an employer, everything you do for that employer just thrives. Why? Because you have the blessing right? The Bible says in, in Psalms, it says, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. It just follows you. It's a real thing. So Esau is bawling. He is so angry. He hates his brother, wants to kill him. Jacob freaks out. He's scared. He runs. And there's this moment where Jacob realizes way later in life, he's got these wives, he's got all this blessing, and he wants to fix things because he knows he did it the wrong way. You know, there's only so far you can go receiving what you have in life the wrong way to get to the top. When you've lied about people you love, when you've done those things that are deceptive, right? Any of you have that guilty conscience? I couldn't lie to my parents very long. Does anybody have that? Like I could lie to my parents for one night and then I'd have to tell them myself because I couldn't handle lying to them. And they, I remember one time my brother Aaron and I, we were out, um, and we lied about where we were staying the night. So I said I was staying at my best friend's house, and then I snuck in there. It's terrible. But I, that, that's back in the day when your phones were plugged into walls. And I went to say goodnight to my dad, and I leaned down and gave him a hug, and I unplugged the phone so that the mom couldn't call in the middle of the night or, you know, it's, it's terrible. And y'all can't take that idea because you don't have phones plugged into walls anymore saying but my brother Aaron he was the instigator and he was the one who convinced me to lie 
And he went, and I have this guilty conscience. It's bad. I, I can't. I, I'm not a good liar. But I was good then at the moment. And then, because I had literally, what good is my birthright if I have no friends and I have no life, right? So I'm going to go out and party with all these kids. And they rented a cabin, and we're all going to get together with friends. And I was not a Christian. I wasn't raised in the kingdom, okay? So I go to this cabin, and I'm hanging out with all these friends. And um, my brother, my brother Aaron's there. And he lied and said he was staying the night at a friend's house, right? So our fates are attached. And we come back the next morning. My dad says something and asks me a question. And I'm, like, playing along with it like, yeah. And we got away with it. And then all of a sudden, my conscience got so heavy, I couldn't handle it. And I just literally unloaded on my father, crying. We didn't stay the night. I stayed the night. And I gave him the whole download. And my brother Aaron was like, what are you doing? Because he was totally good with lying, right? And I literally give it all to him. We get grounded. He's so mad at me because I can't handle the guilt. I can't. I can't lie to my dad. I love him. And so my... This moment, I'm relating to Jacob because Jacob's having this come into Jesus moment with himself. And he's like, I can't live this way anymore. I need to go face my brother. And he's worried that his brother's going to kill him. He hears that his brother's on his way. So he sends out herds of animals as gifts ahead of him to give to Esau. And then he has this moment where he sends his wife and his daughter somewhere else just in case Esau kills him. And so in chapter, let's see. 32 is where you see it go down, right before. So years later, they're going to meet up. Are you ready for this moment? In verse 22, it says, During the night, Jacob arose, woke up to his two wives, his two maidservants, and 11 sons, and had them cross the ford of the Jabbok River, and he sent them across along with everything he had. And Jacob was left all alone. So he's waiting to meet Esau. He's waiting to make it right. He sent them across with everything he had, and Jacob was left all alone. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man appeared and wrestled with him until daybreak. Could you imagine? It's dark. You're all alone. It's the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, some dude shows up and starts wrestling you. What do you think Jacob, just be there in the moment. Live in the moment with me for a second. Who do you think Jacob thought it was? Esau? My mind went there. My brothers come upon me and we're wrestling, right? Who else do you think Jacob could have thought that that was? Burglar? Somebody to rob him, right? So he begins this wrestling match. And he wrestled with him until daybreak. And the wrestling that they did was no easy wrestling. It was gnarly. It was rolling around on the ground, thrashing. It was a wrestling like you probably haven't seen. And when the man saw that he was not winning the match or he was not prevailing, he struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of joint, leaving it wrenched as he continued to wrestle with him. So he literally goes, ting, to Jacob's hip, and Jacob's hip gets thrown out of joint. Anybody ever had a something out of joint? It's painful, right? So basically, whoever this is wrestling knocks Jacob's hip out of joint and keeps wrestling him. And you automatically go, how was he able to do that, right? So this guy, whoever it is, is wrestling him. He knocks his hip out of joint. And eventually the man said to him, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob refused. No, not until you bless me. Now, as you're reading this story, you go say, what? Wait a second. Why is Jacob asking some stranger, possibly Esau, his brother, whomever he's wrestling in this moment, why is he saying that you can't go until you bless me? Because Jacob knows something. And now you know something because he knows whoever's with him has the ability to bless him. So he knows he's not wrestling some natural human being. 
You have the power to bless me. Now let me ask you a question. Is it an angel? Many theologians say this was the angel of the Lord. And many theologians believe that when you see the angel of the Lord in the Bible, that phrase, it's not talking about any angel. It's talking about Jesus himself. So let's pretend that in this moment, Jacob is in fact wrestling Jesus himself. And he realizes about mid-wrestle who this is. He has to know who he is. And he says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And I used to hold on to this story as a Christian and go, I get it, Jacob. Because sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's at the altar, sometimes it's in my room. It depends on where I'm at in my life. I'm sitting there in the presence of God broken. And I'm like, God, I'm not leaving here till you change me. I can't do this on my own. I'm not leaving here until you change me. And I literally just want to hold the presence there until I change. Because I'm not moving forward. I'm not going backward, but I'm not where I want to be. You promised this and this for my life, but I'm not seeing it right? And I'm thinking it's your blessing that I need. I just need your blessing on my life, God. But the other day I was reading this story and I saw something totally different. Jacob thought he was wrestling his brother. Maybe he thought he was wrestling his enemy. Sometimes young Christians, you think you're wrestling the culture. You think you're wrestling a friend. If I could just get them to forgive me or if I could just do you know what I mean? Whatever it is, and you, and you don't think you're progressing for whatever reason. Maybe you think you're wrestling with family or, or your history. Maybe you're wrestling with your inabilities. Whatever those things are, whatever it is keeping you from progressing with God. And he says, no, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And it's super interesting what I believe is Jesus in this moment says to him. Because you'll see later he gets a new name, but in this moment, and you'll see why he gets the new name, but in this moment, Jesus doesn't bless him. And actually, up until this point, he does everything that the Lord says he did to get this new name. But there's something that Jesus does in this moment. Let's say it's the angel of the Lord, or if it, it, if it is Jesus, but let's just say it is in this moment. And he says, what is your name? He says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And Jesus pauses and he says, what is your name? And Jacob cries out and he says his name. Before that moment, Jacob knows everything his name means. So let's say he says this. My name is Deceiver. And what Jesus is trying to do is, here's, see, what you may be wrestling, young one, in your life is maybe not that friend or this one. It's wrestling with this identity that you're trying to hold on to. You're wrestling with this, this place in your life, and, and you think it's if this happens, and if it that happens, and God, I just need your blessing on it, right? And, and he's saying, no, no, your answer is in facing yourself because you are supposed to be the one that had the blessing of the Lord, right? You're supposed to be the one that has the firstborn birthright, but you've been doing it your own way, Jacob. You're serving me, but you're doing it your own way, in your own strength, and you will strive there, but you're going to hit a wall, right? You might make it to where you're going, but you're going to hit a wall, right? And so Jacob has this encounter with, I believe, the Son of God wrestling him right there. He's, and it's so awesome because Jesus didn't do that to hurt him. He basically did that to keep him from hurting himself. He's saying, you're not ready to go face your brother yet. First, you have to face yourself. So he calls out his name. He says, I'm a deceiver. And this is the best part of the whole story. 
Eventually, the man said to him, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob refused. No, not until you bless me. But what Jacob didn't need, he didn't need the blessing. He needed a new identity. He said, what is your name? And he asked the man, and he, Jesus, uh, Jacob says he replied, Jacob. But really, he replied, deceiver, supplanter, cheater. And the man said to him, your new name, your new name is Israel. Your name is Israel, for you have struggled both with God and with people and have overcome. Now, Israel means one who struggled with God and prevailed. May God preserve or prince with God. Israel means, if you want to write it down, one who struggled with God and prevailed. May God preserve or prince with God. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. And the man responds, why ask my name? The man replied. When he spoke, then he spoke a blessing over Jacob. Now you know this is no angel. How can an angel give a blessing? And in your life, God makes you so many promises in this book. This big, beautiful book of life, he makes you promises all over this book. But the best thing that comes out of this book is this new identity. And you can go forward trying to hold on to your old identity in little ways and not even know it. And you think you're not progressing for these other reasons, but he's saying, let me help you. Now, God doesn't put sickness or disease on a person. We know that. In the New Testament, you can't find that anywhere. Why did he in the Old Testament? Well, Jesus hadn't come yet. Jesus took it all upon himself. He became a curse for you. So you know. But sometimes God will knock you out of joint. What does that mean? all of a sudden things will get really hard. What used to make you happy no longer satisfies you anymore. Let me, let me tell you how he knocks you out of joint. He doesn't sit there and put your hip literally out of joint. He doesn't step in and really wrestle you. He's, he's the father. He knows what's best for you. You guys ever seen a little kid throw a fit and think they want another hour of TV at night? I mean, they start crying. Anybody ever seen that? Or they want that juice box. And you're like, you don't need any more sugar, right? And you know what they need. They just need a nap. Anybody work with little kids? And they're bawling. They're throwing a fit. It's because you won't let me blah, 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 right? And God is literally like that with us sometimes. We're like, I need this in my life, Lord. Give me this friend. <laughs> Give me that boy. All that, whatever. And he's like, no, really what you need is a nap, Right? So you can think clearly because your head's messed up, right? I need this in my life. If you would just give, I remember that, those moments as a teenager. Do you guys remember those moments? You're like, this is the end of the world. It's the end of the world as we know it. The boy breaks up with you, you know, whatever. The girl breaks up with the guy. I'm going to die now, right? If you would just give me and God's like, no, I know what you need. I know what you need, right? And you're wrestling with him as if you think you know what's best for you. But let me tell you what it looks like in the New Testament when you hit a wall. You're going through the motions just like you always have, but all of a sudden, you're miserable. And you think you're fighting the devil. Sometimes you think you're fighting the devil. You're like, I'm just, I'm just pushing through. I'm just going to keep standing, right? I'm going to keep believing. And, and you think you're fighting the devil, but really you're fighting God. <laughs> And he's saying, if you would just sit with me and face yourself, I'll fix it. Because I see the problem. The problem is the identity you're walking in, and I just want to exchange it for you. Right? 
For a moment, you think it's this one little thing, it's this one little detail. I, I've had that just even recently. Afton, you had an identity issue? I did. Am I backslidden? No, but I'm wrestling with God, and I think I'm fighting the devil. I'm literally speaking the word. I'm literally standing in truth. I'm fighting all the things. I'm, I'm fighting the fight of faith. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith, right? And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in the presence of God. I've been on a fast, and I'm reading the Bible, and it's coming alive to me, and Jacob starts speaking, and God says, hey, Jacob. He's not calling me a deceiver. He's calling me by what I'm wrestling with, and I'm going, oh, I'm wrestling you. And God says, Afton, you're not advancing to where you want to be. Because if you get what you want, still operating the way you're operating, you won't be strong enough to walk in it. And you think it's because the devil's stopping you here and he's using these people and this really hurt and all that. And you think you're up against all those things, but really it's me. And I'm holding you back until you deal. Until you learn how to operate differently so that you can be healthy. healthy. And I'll just tell on myself, one of the ways that I operated with is I spent too, I gave too much attention trying to hover and help others instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to do that. And even though I wasn't wrestling with them in person, I wasn't like, let's say, let's say Gabe was struggling. And I wasn't like beating on Gabe's door or whatever, but I had Gabe on my heart or my mind because I was worried about him. So I'm worrying about him as a pastor, and I'm sitting there worrying, worrying, worrying. And I'm praying for him, and God's like, stop wrestling. Give him to me. I'm just using Gabe as an example right? Let's say, let's say I haven't seen you in a while and I'm, I'm worried about that or, or, or I have a friend that's not talking to me or I have whatever, right? And I'm hovering those things in my mind. I'm not, I'm not wrestling with a person, but I have really good arguments in my head and I win them all. Say. But I'm wrestling, I'm wrestling, I'm wrestling because I'm a worrier. I'm not a worrier anymore in Jesus' name, but, but the Lord said, Afton, if you're called to this level, as a minister, I don't know what you're called to. I don't know what you're wrestling with. You, I hope that you can relate in some way. But I was wrestling with him. And I thought it was circumstances. I thought it was people. I thought it was the amount of weight to run a building and all those things. And really, it wasn't any of those things. He was saying, Afton, you need to face yourself of how you function. And you need to literally not worry. You need to cast every care on me. That was my wrestling. I was wrestling with cares. Even if it looks like pastoring, you need to cast your care on me. Those are my kids. You need to, you need to, you need to let them love on them if you can, but then you need to give them to me. With your own kids, the things that I need to get in them before they graduate. I've got Asher leaving the house this year. And all those worries and concerns that come with that as a mom. Does he really know everything he needs to know? Have I done a good job? You need to give that to me. And you need to stop wrestling. Because you won't advance until you face yourself. Amen? So I'm just being so honest. Because I found myself in Jacob a story that I've read a hundred times. When I first came to the Lord, I found myself in Esau. But now I read it, I find myself in Jacob, and I'm not a deceiver. I told you, I can't even lie to my dad. I told all my brother. But in that moment, all of a sudden, I saw myself. Why? Because that's what God intended for those stories, for you to find yourself. So tonight, my question is, are you wrestling the enemy, or are you really wrestling him? Because can I tell you something? If you're wrestling him, you won't win. And every bit of what he does to hold you there is because he loves you too much to let you go. I believe that if Jacob would have gone to see Esau without that blessing and without that new name, Esau very well could have taken his brother's life. Anything that God does to keep you there is because he has a future for you that is so amazing. 
And it doesn't look like your mother's future. It doesn't look like your father's future. It doesn't look like for your sister's future. It doesn't look like your brother's. It looks like yours, and it has your name. I have a question for you. God gave a new name to Abraham. He gave a new name to Sarah. He gave a new name to Jacob. He gave a new name to Paul. He gave a new name to Simon, which was Peter. What is your new name? What do you think he would call you? And if anything bad enters your mind, that's not him. Because Jacob was deceiver, and he says, your name's Israel. Right? So in this moment of what it is, my name is warrior. <laughs> I worry all the time. My name is, what if somebody's name was gossiper? I don't know. I'm just throwing out labels. That person's known for that. What if your new name to him is truth teller, right? What is your new name? Sometimes I ask, Lord, what is going to be on my stone, that white one? And is it already there? Because there is a new name written down in glory for me that's just my own. And then when I overcome, and I will, you going to overcome? When we go home, are we going to be able to walk in saying we overcame? We overcame, right? So you're going to get a new name, Oliver. What is it going to be? Katie, you're going to get a new name because you overcame. What's it going to be? Ava, you got a new name. It's written down in glory. What is it going to be? It's going to be on a white stone. And he chose it for you. Even though your mom gave you the name Ava. And it's probably beautiful. I bet it doesn't mean supplanter or what was Sarah's, Sarai's name again? Good. Quarrelsome. Yeah. Guarantee you it doesn't mean that. It means something beautiful. My name is basic. It's like a, of an English root. That's where it comes from. It has no meaning. Often has no meaning. I'm excited for my new name because I want it to mean something. I named Asher Asher because his name means blessed, fortunate, and to be envied. His name means favored among his brethren. So every time I call Asher Asher, I'm calling him blessed. I'm calling him fortunate. I'm calling him to be envied. Gideon means mighty man of valor who is like God. That's what Michael means, his middle name. So I'm calling Gideon mighty man who is like God, right? Asher, um, Cole is his middle name. It's a derivative of Nicole or, or Nicodemus, really. And that means the people's victory. Those are cool names, but what is his name in glory? I bet Nathan has a cool name because I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible. McKenna is a beautiful name, right? That's your name? What's your new name? Well, you know what Sarah means. It means princess. But God has even got a better name than that. Simon went from Simon to Peter, which means rock. He didn't look like a rock before, <laughs> Right? So my question is for you, what is it that you are wrestling with? What identity are you still trying to hold on to? What area have you not let him deal with? For me, I need to cast care and, and let it go. For some of you, you're still trying to be someone you're not. Whatever it is. But isn't it awesome that God calls you by your name? He calls you by your name and not by your sin. Amen? If we could go ahead and start that first song. I just want to end with worship.